Welcome back to another episode of the Todd Durkin Impact Show. This is Todd Durkin. I'm at the global headquarters. My friends, I'm super fired up today. I'm doubly amped up today because I have a legend in the house. His name is Mark Rippin. You're like, Mark Rippin? Yeah, that guy. The guy, the, the former Washington Redskins. Yes, the Washington Redskins quarterback. 1991 Super Bowl MVP quarterback under coaches, Coach Joe Gibbs's tutelage. Mark Rippin is in the house. Now, I have the opportunity now to train Mark's uh, nephew, Brett Rippin, who's a quarterback for the Denver Broncos. But you got you to gotta realize here, Mark Rippin was a quarterback with the Redskins. When I was growing up back in New Jersey, I was a New York Jets. Giants fan. I mean, you, we're talking Phil Sims, Joe Joe Montgomery, Phil McConkey, Lawrence Taylor, Carl Banks, Leonard Marshall. You name it. The Giants were my team. But I went to William and Mary down in Virginia, and that was the heart of Redskins country. And I heard a lot about Mark Rippon. And uh, through the circle of life, it's come full circle now that Mark Rippon and I have connected because he's doing some great things in the world today. And I want to share that in today's episode. So without further ado, over to the TDE Global Headquarters in San Diego, California with my friend Mark Rippon. We are back. And uh, man, it's so good to have you in the house. Yeah, it's great I, to be here. I am honored. I got to tell a little story. So, 1989, I make my way down to William and Mary. I grew up in Brick, New Jersey. Make my way down to William and Mary, and I was a big Giants fan growing up. Big yeah, Giants fan. You told Phil me that, yeah. Sims, Hostetler, you McConkey, you name it. I, I those are my Anderson, guys. Anderson, yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Then I go There's down. There's guy Lawrence Taylor, I think, L is there the, too. The yeah. original <laughs> LT, right? Fifty six Banks, all these guys. Then I go down to William and Mary. And when William Mary is in Williamsburg, Virginia, we are in the heart of Redskins country. And my roommate, I mean, you tell me, he was a huge Redskins fan. Everyone's a Redskins fan. And the next thing I know, I'm hearing about the Washington Redskins all the time. And of course, the Redskins and, and the Giants were huge, huge rivals, rivals at the yeah, time. Absolutely. But I actually played college football with J.D. Gibbs. And yeah. J.D. was the son of your coach, Joe Gibbs. And Coach Gibbs would fly down every Friday after your practice, take a helicopter, land at William & Mary's Field, watch J.D. have dinner, and then fly back um, after the game. Uh, he'd watch the game on Saturday. Um, so I slowly started to become a, I don't want to say a Redskins fan, but I would watch. And I'd give, you know, little jobs and that. But... I know you had a, an illustrious career with the Redskins, and I want to talk about a few things. Number one, Coach Gibbs. Talk about Coach Gibbs. Wow. Um, first and foremost, you, you mentioned you know everything he did for Coy and, and JD. I yeah. mean, he would try to do. I mean, Coy ends up going all the way out to Stanford. It right. became Remember, a little bit more of a challenge for him. Right? Yeah, yep. it became a little bit more of a challenge for him to, you know, get out and see Coy play. But everything he did for JD and. You know, you know the story that uh, the tragic story of, of, of JD and losing, mm -hmm. you know, his life about four or five years ago. But Joe Gibbs was probably the, I would say, the epitome of what you would like as a, a father figure. Never mind a head football Absolutely. coach. Absolutely. Um, he had a uh, a goal in mind. He had a group of guys that he had in mind too. So it wasn't like these were kind of hand picked guys that Joe were go Joe Gibbs guys. You know, and I think he, he when he when the draft came about, he wanted to know more about the player personal life than he did the player in, on the football field Interesting. because, because he was probably than to, today well i mean there's there's certain teams and there's yeah. certain owners and there's certain coaches that want the character character guys you know and that's was uh, and even joe said in, in his late later stages of his coaching that he kept guys a little bit longer in their tooth than he wanted to but they're great in the locker room mm -hmm. and i think you know you you kind of preach that a lot is about what kind of a guy are you when the lights aren't on, you know, right. when the cameras aren't running, what are you doing what you can in the weight room? Are you doing what you can in the training room? Are you doing what you can with your peers and your teammates? And we are probably the last of the dinosaurs too, Todd, you know, I mean that era because there was no free agency. You didn't have anywhere to right. go. You know, you stayed in there, you entrenched yourself in the community. You became a vital part of that community. And Joe stressed that too. He wanted his guys to be stick, stick around all year round do whatever you have to do and, and, and become, you know, part of that uh, community and be that part culture. of that foot, 
football culture. Football culture. Absolutely. And, and Coach Riley was your strength coach. His D-boy. son, Marty, yep. played with me at William & Mary. Talk about the strength and conditioning back in the late <laughs> 80s and 90s. How is it different How is it different then than what it is now? Well, I think I, I shared with you about two or three weeks ago about uh, the, one of the funniest things ever. You got probably – one of the greatest strength coaches, Dan Riley, was a, was a, high, a big believer in hammer strength, you know, and yeah. be, making sure you not only did you get strong, but your muscles were stretched too. And for quarterbacks, that was great. You know, even for the big guys, they could still put on as much weight as they could. But Dan was, uh, you know, he was he was far far ahead of uh, of the of the curve at that point in time. But he did have a little bit of a challenge, being that. Jack Ken Cook, our owner, had all these deals. He had deals with United Airlines, deals with Marriott Hotels, deals with certain you know things in, in, in the organization. He also had a deal with McDonald's. So <laughs> when you're Dan Riley and Bubba Tyre, our, our trainer, our head trainer, and our head strength coach, and we're being fed, this is a world championship organization, double quarter pounders with cheese, French fries, Stop. and apple pies Stop. every day. Think about that every day. Every day. How would, that, how would that go over today? Not good. That wouldn't work. No. And then finally, what I... Every day? Every day. And so, well, Friday was a treat. Um, the Alpine <laughs> restaurant would come in, and they'd have these creamy pastas and stuff they'd be feeding us afterwards, kind of a treat for us, you know. But when you think about it, and you look back on that, and, and then I finally got to the latter part of my, my career, and I got into into training tables and where they had red, green, and, and yellow, <laughs> you know, items on the food. Red meaning stop, make sure you yep. think about this, taking moderation yellow you know it's okay you know but moderation. don't yeah, yeah yeah moderation also and then green eat as much of it as you want whenever you want so yeah it changed but the for for Dan Riley and, and Bubba Tyre and and that organization Joe Gibbs to do what they did you know having to these challenges and there's you know I would consider that a major challenge now in today's health and fitness for our for have our you athletes thought to yourself and I know you had an illustrious career but have you ever thought to yourself man I wonder how good I would have been if I really trained and ate like I should have then like they do now you've trained one of the greatest in the world and I guarantee you one of your one of your successes that both both you and Drew have is the overall uh, component of, of of health mind body mind health everything possible to put into your body to make you the yeah. Yeah. in this in this career that you have and I I'll have to be honest Tom Brady Drew Brees those guys they wouldn't. They would probably last as long as I did. You know, thirteen years and and trying to get it done with with the resources we had was difficult. Now these guys are absolute. I wouldn't even say maniacs. They're 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 doing the right things for their bodies, for their families, for being able to right. watch their daughters right. and sons and granddaughters grow and be healthy and 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 vibrant. You know, when 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 they get older. I mean, I even think from a quarterback perspective, I think about what how I trained in high school and college. And I, I let me tell you, I loved lifting. I was I loved the weight room, but it was cleans, squats, that's it, step ups, lat pulls, bench press, and arm farm arms and i'm like wait a second i'm a rotational athlete now obviously a little smarter then but the 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 methodology was much different in the 80s and even 90s about as a rotational athlete uh how we need to train the core how we need to train the shoulders and the mobility flexibility i mean massage therapy was a luxury i mean that was like wow if you get a massage now it's a necessity it's part of the routine pilates and flexibility oh, is damn. part of the routine i'm like man if i would have known then i would i wonder if i would have been like how good could i have been totally and when you think about it totally would have avoided back surgeries with back injuries and knee surgeries and everything else i'm like wow we've come a long way and really 20, 30 years. Well, you think about it, plyometrics back in the late 90s was, wow, the plyometrics, oh. you know, I mean, that's great. Now, you, you talk about uh, every team has five or six massage therapists that travel yep. with them. Every team has two or three chiropractors that travel with yeah. them. A chiropractor back in the 80s and 90s was considered a voodoo doctor, you know? And there's no way Bubba Tyre would have a, 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 a chiropractor yeah. on our football team because... And, and I get uh, it, you know, right. because there's a there's a, that mystique of they didn't know any better. I, and now there's so much knowledge I on the internet. I remember reading a book. Internet? In, How in about top, there was internet? There was an internet. <laughs> internet. I remember reading a book from a guy named Jimmy Radcliffe who was at Oregon, and then uh, Tudor Bampa. It was all plyometrics. I'm like, if I can get my fast twitch and really become a from go from like a four eight four nine guy to like a four six guy, like man, this is really gonna help my game. I remember doing these things called box jumps. <laughs> like nowadays, it's an everyday thing. We're doing plyometrics yep. and fast twitch. It's just as a as a as part a, of the protocol. Part of the protocol, absolutely. <laughs> Tell me about the Redskins again. I, I I think of some of your teammates. 
um, Jacoby, what's number 66, I think Art Monk. Um, who were some of the, the teammates that stood out to you as, as great men and great teammates? Well, Art Monk was a consummate pro, you know, mm. very quiet and, mm. and not a vocal guy, you know, in the locker room. There's, <laughs> But, you know, you always see that in your high school teams. The most vocal guy was probably the guys wasted his energy on the bus going to the game and not worried about what he did during the game, you know. And Monk but was quiet. My, Art was the uh, quietest guy, but he's also had so much respect from the players because his off-season training, both him and Daryl, uh, Daryl Green, Green, you know, and, and look at their, look at, yeah, look at their longevity too. Does anyone else out there, I got a, a random question for you listeners, is anyone else out there maniacal about old numbers like Art Monk, 81, right? Yes. Daryl Green, 28. Jacoby, 66? Yep. I, I mean, I have this memory of like, uh, ripping 11. Like, I, I can see numbers like anywhere, like, from 1985 on, I can name pretty much anyone's number. Offensive line, it doesn't even matter. If it's football, I know everyone's number and that. Who else? You got Monk, we you got for, Jacoby. We, for, we forgot what we did yesterday. But you yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, we, but, right? Uh, you know, I mean, just uh, just, just great uh, mm. great pros, great great guys, you know, in the locker room. And that's, again, that was that about was Riggins? Joe Gibbs. John, John Riggins, 44. John was there after I uh, got there, after I got there. I mean, I'd already, he he'd already left. Team. Yeah, he was, he was on the uh, 82 championship team. He wasn't on the 87-88. Eight team with uh, with Doug Williams, but he uh, just retired the year before um, Joe broke his leg, you know. And but you know, you had guys, but that was back, you know. You had guys like Theismann and Riggins come around the locker room, and you know, and nowadays it's almost you know these guys see these old veterans come around the locker room. What the heck are they doing here? You know, yeah. there was no accountability piece. The accountability piece we had was the guys that played before us and won Super Bowls before us. Our fan base if we didn't go deep into the playoffs it was a disappointment yeah you know now if you make the playoffs it's like wow there's a victory right there so there's a lot of accountability because there's the older players would kind of always kind of show yeah. up and you wanted to you know wanted to make make right to that so let me tell you rfk stadium back oh. in the day uh, did you get to go to many games? i never no i never went to a redskins game when you were playing uh but rfk uh with with those legendary teams back then i'd watch them because they were on every sunday and uh, we'd watch them uh down in williamsburg virginia and people would be hooting and hollering as long as it wasn't the giants i would be too um <laughs> But uh, what, what the, the nickname of the the, the, not the, hogs. the hogs, the hogs, and then you had all the the folks, the hogettes, the, the hogettes, and yep. everything else, uh, folks. What I want to do here is uh, my, we had a band. You had a band. Does any other team in the no. NFL have a band? No, no. The Redskins, the the Washington Redskins. Yes. <laughs> now referred to as what are they now? The, the Washington Washington Football Team. Man, what what do you think about that? By the way. Well, I I, I if. It would have been done in the way that I thought it should have been done. Right. Is had the Native American leaders mm. come in and, and say, "Hey, this is you know we're, we've we've talked as a collective group, and it's a very derogatory term, and we would like to you to think about changing the name." I think it would have had a lot of merit, but for corporate America to come in and say, "Because of the name and because of the the, the drawback we're getting, we're losing business because people are you know." protesting it seems kind of the the thing to do these days is to protest everything and anything they were losing business and the name was changed was mm. forced to be changed dan snyder had no at, at at from the start of the team to all the way till the name was changed had no interest whatsoever changing the name and said no it's not going to be changed you mm. know even though he was getting a lot of um political uh pressure to change the name and finally got changed and it was uh you know kind of corporate america saying Interesting. Yeah, and eh, that's BS to me. I think uh, is the, the 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 people that should be have literally skin in the game are the Native American community, and they they were brought in kind of as a gesture more so than the reason and the formula to, that would actually we would all I would. Do you I think, would think if you of, talk yeah. to them, they would want the name to have stayed? The oh, I think there's name? ninety ninety an overwhelming. I don't know exactly percentage, but an overwhelming overwhelming majority of the native american community that thinks what that name represented you know the culture the mm. uh the the team the, the sportsmanship the um, team teamwork you know all those yeah. tangibles that uh, are are healthy to any community would yeah. they would that, that's what they felt was the message that that team had at that point in time. Mark, you're doing some amazing things now for the community, not only up in the great Northwest, but nationwide. Before we go there, I just want to step back. For all you listening in, sometimes you hear, oh, Super Bowl winning quarterback, had a, a great career in the NFL. But there's a backstory. How did you get to where you were? 
I'm always fascinated by like, you know, you, you were, I believe, one of the only Canadians at the time, right? You you were yeah. born and raised in Canada and then at age five moved to the U.S. And then what happened? Like, how did you get to the NFL? I'm sure it was paved with some roadblocks and adversities. Oh, absolutely. Like they like you everything. Give me a quick story on that. Well, I was born in Calgary, Canada. Yep. You know, I was, uh, my dad was watching his um, idol at the time, Gordie Howe, play against his cousin in an yeah. exhibition game in Calgary. Um, his, uh, cousin, Freddie Churla was playing, whose son, Shane Churla, ended up playing in the NHL for a bunch of years. Freddie was playing an exhibition game against Gordie Howe. And huh. my dad was at the game the day I was to be born, you know, because back then dads couldn't be in when, when mothers are delivering. So was, and I would, and my mom saying, yeah, go watch a hockey game. You know, <laughs> I'm just going to have another kid here. You know, so don't worry about it. <laughs> so about midway through the game, I was called and, uh, you know, your son's being born and I thought my name would be Gordy, but you know, thank goodness it wasn't. I, <laughs> I kind of like Mark, and but uh, so yeah, I was uh, I was born October second, nineteen sixty two, in Foothill Hospital in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Lived there. We had my brother Tim, or my sister Colleen was the first, and she was born in Calgary. My brother Tim and myself were both uh, Calgarians. My brother Dave uh, was born in Edmonton, and then my sister Shannon was the only one that was born in the U.S. Both my brothers, Tim and Dave, played in the Canadian national baseball team. Okay. And um, so that's kind of when we came back to the U.S. That was the first thing, our first love. My dad was a great baseball player. He played actually one year at Seattle University, and he got to see the, the great Elgin Baylor play basketball. Yeah. But he left school and came back. He got homesick. But baseball was kind of always our, our yeah. forte. Yet. We, I think I had a mitt in my hand before I could even hold a mitt. You know, as like one year old, he put this. The mitt's on. Yeah, the yep. mitt's on. Let's go play baseball. And um, hockey, we tried it, but it was too expensive, yep. you know, so when you got to, to the U.S. And so baseball was kind of our niche, you know. Huh. But when I couldn't throw or hit a curveball, my days were numbered. <laughs> and I think Ryan Sandberg hit a home run on me in Legion Baseball that uh, the only park would have been maybe Yellowstone Park that it would have been kept <laughs> in, you know. And so I love baseball. Former Cub. Yep, former Cub and Hall of Famer and Spokenite and, and uh, North Central High School grad and so yeah, so that, that was kind of uh, you know when we came down to the U.S. and huh. gathered us all together. Brothers, brothers were really good. Tim played five years in the Toronto Blue Jay organization with David Wells, um, Dave Steeb, you know uh, Jimmy Key, all those guys. He caught them. He was a catcher. Uh, he was the only guy I think the only Canadian ever or was the first Canadian team ever to beat Cuba in international play. Okay. He had a grand salami, grand slam against them in, in uh, Antwerp, Belgium, to no beat uh, Cuba 8-7 uh, back in, I think it was 80, uh, 84. So how would you make the jump from baseball to football? Well, um, so we did as kids. We played everything. Yep. You know, I played yep. basketball. I was a awkward kid in, in my, my, my matter of fact my mom when I was in fifth or sixth grade would watch me run up and down the court I was good but she was worried more about my legs breaking I was tall skinny and awkward you know and I hadn't kind of come into my own so she was more about gosh I just hope he doesn't break his legs or something like that got into junior high and ended up uh, you know kind of liking basketball I love they still love baseball that was my sport huh. and then um, junior high that's when football tackle football and I hated football absolutely hated it you know, because I had to play as a seventh grader. I had to play as a nose tackle because I was <laughs> tall, but I was right at that lightweight. Yep. I played in a lightweight, you know, so <laughs> I was 100 and it had to be under 115 pounds. So I was like 114. So I was a quarterback and no way. a nose tackle. No way. Know? And I would just get beat up by these kids, down blocks and all that. <laughs> then I got into this, the, my eighth grade season, I became a linebacker and a quarterback. And You're I had to play up. at the heavyweight division, you know. And that's it was even worse. <laughs> you know, I'm an undersized guy now getting the crap kicked out of me. <laughs> so uh, I hated it, but I did it because my friends were doing it. Yep. So I got into the ninth grade my freshman year, and I found, like, I'm, I can throw the ball. I don't have to play defense. <laughs> you know, they made you play both ways back in then. So uh, I just kind of kept going, kept going, still didn't like it that much because, you know, I mean, you're getting beat up, yeah. you know. And then they always had what they're, you know, what, trying to get away from doing now, bull in the ring or whatever that is, uh, that Army-Navy Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma drill, yeah. you know, two down linemen, a running back, and a linebacker, and two defensive linemen, go. Yep. And I go, oh, do I have to do this? <laughs> I mean, I'm never going to ever get to a position where I, even if I scramble, I'm going to throw it out of bounds. I'm not going to run with it. So, but yeah, so that, that, that was kind of my least favorite of the three. Love basketball, you know, and, and not to toot my horn, I was um, All-American in basketball, um, baseball and football, 
in, all American, in, all three in, sports. in high school. Well, like honorable mention in basketball. Yeah. I held John Stockton to 32 a game in high school. <laughs> I, mean, literally, I mean, it was like right in his job. What did he average? Know, like 50? Right, he, was, he was averaging 12. <laughs> Wow. Um, yeah. So, so I played against Stockton, played against Sandberg. You know, yeah. we had some 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 pretty good athletes there. But I love basketball. We won the state championship okay. my uh, my senior year. I don't want to get into the some detail. good hoops up there though. Oh yeah, Mercer Island with yeah. uh, Quinn Schneider and and you know I mean they had some they they they've won like eight state championships over the years. But we beat them in a, in a controversial game that their coach took to Supreme Court. But that that'd be another episode. You know, <laughs> take too long to go over that one. But so basketball was great. I loved it. But when it came time to you know, uh, um, getting a scholarship opportunity to go to school somewhere and, and further my education, and, and football was a, was a plateau for that. I was recruited by a lot of schools, got a personalized letter from one of our doctor friends, new Bear Bryant, got a personalized letter from Bear Bryant saying, mm. we'd love to have you come down here. I know we don't do what you like to do, you know. And back then, we didn't throw the ball much, but we threw it 25, you know, times a game. I mean, Brett in high school, my nephew, threw it like 45 times a game. Yeah. I mean, they were they were a league, league of... Uh, so did Brett end up... Breaking oh, all your records? Halfway through his junior year. <laughs> I mean, that's how much they threw it. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that's the city records, you know. That, that's not just our high school records because the same high school I was. That was a city record. I had the city record that, that I can't believe was stood that long of time. And, and he came through by his, halfway through his junior year. I mean, he had wiped him out. But he started as a freshman. So when know. Mark's saying Brett, we're talking about Brett Rippon, who is now with the Denver Back Broncos, with, yep. who uh, we train here and I train at Fitness Quest 10, is a great guy, looks up to his Uncle Mark. And uh, and he, he, by the way, made sure I asked you, at what point of his high school career did he break your passing record? Oh yeah, <laughs> halfway through. Yeah, he halfway wants through. to get he wants a good laugh out of that one. You got a good laugh out of that one, buddy. <laughs> love it. I yeah. Love it. So, anyways, uh, so football, and I end up uh, you know going to Washington State University. Had a you know uh, was there under Coach Jim Walden. We kind of ran uh, counter counter dive option and some option stuff. So I had to run the ball a few times too, and, huh. and that was kind of fun. But it wasn't. I would like to have just been a shotgun and sl- never was in a shotgun my whole career ever. Joe wow. Gibbs all under center. Most yep. of the teams I played with all under center. I think one of the years I played with um, uh, the, the Eagles, I got to go in the shotgun when Rodney Pete got hurt. Uh, I played mm. one year with uh, uh, John Gruden there with the Eagles, but Interesting. You know, always under the center. So I went to Washington State. Um, Reuben Mays was there, yeah. and you know Reuben. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe could have been one of the best running backs in, hmm. in the pro football game, but snapped both his Achilles in consecutive yeah. years. Yep, yep, yep. After he made the first 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 year rookie all rookie Pro Bowl team, and um, so anyways, we had a good time in Pullman, and a lot of good memories. A lot of my buddies are just up the road in Tustin, Santa uh, Laguna Beach, and so. And then you got drafted. Got drafted in the sixth round. Yep. Tom Brady and I, I kind of set the set the bar. I said, <laughs> "Here's where six rounders go. We go right to the Super Bowl." Yeah. You know, Tom just continuing going to Super Bowls, and and uh, but yeah, I had a had I was in a fortunate uh, situation there because it was after Joe. Had, Broken his leg. Everyone remembers that Monday mm-hmm. night game against, mm-hmm. against arguably, if not the greatest football player in the history of the game, Lawrence Taylor. That's right. And um, matter of fact, after that game, Joe Gibbs vowed that we were going to put a special blocking scheme in. No, but nowhere at no point in time when we played the New York Giants were we ever going to leave Lawrence Taylor one on one. And that's even if he dropped into coverage, which he. Very rarely did, ever yeah, did, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. We are going to have if a back had a free release on a on a route, and Jim Lachey was our left tackle or Jacoby was our left tackle. You were chipping, and you were going to take a chunk out of Lawrence Taylor wow. before he got to you know the upfield up to rush. That's how good he was. And if you're on the tight end side, the tight end and the right tackle, or tight end and the left tackle, depending on what side LT was on. Or make sure that we're double teaming him. We're not going to give him. That's how great a football player. That was a great was. defense with Banks. And, Banks and yeah. oh yeah, I mean incredible. Marshall defense. Leonard yep. Marshall yep. seventy. Yep. Well, the, yeah, that was, those are some good. Eric Howard, teams. Washington State Coug. You know, yeah. was a little nose tackle there for yep. for you guys for a while. Yep, and that was well coached team and just a uh, you know great franchise. And it's kind of sad to see the Redskins and the Giants kind of. Washington football team and the Giants kind of head in the directions they're heading. So then, got a chance, an opportunity to to become a Redskin um, in the sixth round. Got there. I have to tell you about my how I became emphatic about golf. I was a 
28 handicapper in college. You know, I was Jeez. just, we had a little goat ranch, nine hole course. And our handicap in golf was how many beers can you drink that hole? You subtract it from the total of that hole. So it was a par, <laughs> par four and you drank and you made a four, four on it and drank two beers, a so net two. I was after studying, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we, I think we had, a, I think we had actually lights too, where we could. <laughs> so oh. yeah, so that was, uh, so I was never a great golfer, but I got to the, in Washington DC when, when I was drafted after training camp, strength conditioning and everything in quarterback school, I was done by like one o'clock and I lived about two blocks away from a golf course. So I said, I'll get a season's pass. And I went from a 28 handicap, self-taught. I remember one thing Lee Trevino said, aim left and, and hit this little fade. And that's what I started doing and went from a 28 handicap and played like 70 consecutive days, got down to like a six or seven wow. and then got the bug, you know, and then ever since just... It's, it's kind of like my second uh, you know, passion. Folks, when you hear Mark's story, realize this. Everyone has a special story, and sometimes we forget you know, the paths and, and in playing multiple sports and, and having a, a vision of what you want to do. He, he mentioned how, how baseball and basketball, were, he both excelled at that, and then football was his opportunity. And you know, sometimes life has its detours. Mark, take us up to now. How do you spend your time now? What are you doing? What are you passionate about? I know golf is part of it, but obviously there's some other initiatives that, that you're doing as well. Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, thank you for allowing me this platform to do so. Well, I've, one of the ones, the things that I did, you know, when I um, was done playing, retired playing, um, was I wanted to honor my son. And, and back in 95, I left the game. Uh, my son was diagnosed with a in, in 1997 with a brain tumor at the age of two. So you were playing. I was, I was actually in, yeah, came, uh, yeah, came back. Um, in 1997, hmm. hmm. no, no, excuse me. 90, 95, I was in 1995, Andrew was born 1996. I'd signed with, um, the, the St. Louis Rams, okay. Dick Vermeil was there yeah. and, uh, became, which wow. became the greatest show on, on turf, turf after yeah. theirs. And um, was, was, we were living in St. Louis. My two girls, Amber and Angela, were uh, going to school at St. Albans, and Andrew was, you know, an infant then. And um, I think he was just uh, just had his second birthday. And I was in training camp up in Macomb, Illinois, where we had our training camp at. And I got a call and said, "Hey, listen, your son Andrew has um, had a seizure." And uh, this is Coach Vermeil brought me into his office and told me this. And and he said, "Mark, I think it'd be good probably to go home and get all those things." taken care of don't worry about it when you come back or if you come back you know we'll, uh, we'll have a spot for you here I mean that's that's coach Vermeil to a T he's just wow. such a great man so I went back and it's a very uh, tough tough scenario to, to come back to absolutely you see your son on life support and, and it's from two years a, old yeah two years old from a seizure you know but you see tubes everywhere and so they're at this point in time you know they've got uh, Caesar medication, so he's you know, stable. And within a day or so, they released him, but they took some MRIs. And we had not, at that point in time, understood what caused the seizure or how the, how the seizure was caused. So uh, the about two days later, Dr. John Demacus, who's the, uh, uh, the, on, uh, or, or the, mm. uh, ner um, well, the brain, brain guy said, hey, listen, Mark, uh, we just want to let you know that we found a mass. You know, okay. We don't know what it is yet. We're going to do a biopsy and find out. Well, it came back that it was a malignant tumor mm. and that um, the thought, thing that he thought would be best at that point in time was to extract it, you know, get uh, most of it. It was called a peanut, too, which is a primitive neuroectodermal tumor, which is kind of rare in a two-year-old, but it's in their frontal lobe. Now, the reason why they couldn't go right in and start radiating is children at that age, you know, when you start rad eradicating a brain, um, you know, their brain doesn't come back. Sure. So you got to go there and remove it. Did some chemo. And he thought the best thing at the time would be, you know, have some, uh, in talking to all the doctors and family members and such, best thing to try to get back to some normalcy. So we went back to St. Louis, which is interesting because the protocol in Spokane had a um, more aggressive protocol than the one in Barnes Jewish Children's Hospital in St. Louis. But the children, we didn't have a children's hospital at the time. We do now, but we didn't have a children's hospital at the time. Got it. So we felt it'd be good to go back, have him be around other kids, have our kids be around other kids there, get back to some normalcy in our lives, mm. and still, you know. So we did that. And for uh, that whole um, four or five months there, he went through some very, you know, aggressive chemo treatment. Just like any kid, they're very, you know, um, resilient, you know, and they, yeah, their, yeah. their blood counts yeah. bounce back a lot quicker than us as adults would, you know, yep. take us a lot longer. So he went through the treatments pretty well, got back to Spokane after it was all said and done and, and the treatments are all over. And, and, um, so they wanted to do another 
you know, MRI just to see what happened. So they did another MRI and they saw that the tumor had come back. It wasn't mm-hmm. as, as big, but it had come back. And this is like early January. Um, but we had another procedure that uh, was just being kind of uh, transitioning through uh, the country and the world. It was called radiation seeds. So they could put these seeds in the tumor bed and they'd have like a 60, 67 to 70 day um, efficiency. And then once they the, they gave way to what they were supposed to do. They felt that would be the the thing that inevitably would uh, mm. would you know cure it. Yeah. You know. So after that, uh, we got an MRI. It's about three months after we got an MRI. It was clear, and he was like any matter of fact. He was I wouldn't say like any other three year old. Even been through his chemo, radi- these radiation seeds, everything else. This kid was as agile and. Um, athletic as you could ever see you know mm, it, yeah, it would have been yeah. it would have been cool it would have been really neat to see what he would have evolved to um but that time he was just like any other three-year-old or it had had actually it hadn't turned three he was about uh yeah. like a month away from being three okay. but he was just active and you know going doing things that three-year-olds Tearing do the and, place apart yeah, yeah yeah and then um but middle of middle of june he had another seizure mm. and so at that point in time we went back in and checked and um, you know, because then you don't know what's what's going on or if it's just uh, something else causing it. But we found out that the tumor had come back twice the original size and that the doctors, you know, basically said, um, you know, we'll do whatever you want us to do. But at this point in time, I think we're fighting an uphill battle. And mm. and I I would have you guys just think about loving him up as much as you can till that time comes, you know. And so wow. nobody ever thinks of, you know, <laughs> waiting till they're – their child has to go and we do it with adults sometimes, you know, when their time comes and, but, um, you know, and then we had to ask our doctor, well, what, what are we looking for? I mean, how could this, you know, how yeah. this go down? You know, he said, well, the best scenario would be you die in his sleep. The worst is, you oh. know, he could be out with a family and, you know, have some sort of tragic, uh, circumstance and, you know, and something that would be hard to, you know, to, to fathom. But, um, you know, if you have any, f- faith in, in our heavenly source above, then you pray for a, the dignity of your son to go in a way that um, you'd, we'd all want to go, and that's die in our sleep, and eventually that's what happened. He, our dog got up in the middle of the night, and mm. which I took my dog outside, and I'm waiting for the dog to go to the bathroom, and it's like they have an innate an instinct Absolutely. animals do, you know. And the whole time uh, from then, my wife and I at the time slept with Andrew in the middle of us, you know, just because we want to be close to him the whole time. Family members were around for the next two months, and on the night of August twenty second, nineteen ninety eight, he died peacefully in his sleep. So, and wow. and the reason I I say that, you know, I mean, mm. we you know we all go through tough life circumstances, and this is maybe one of the toughest. But what you can do, and, and what we eventually did, is we, to honor Aunt Andrew and honor all kids that are going through treatment, is start a foundation. So uh, through that foundation, we, we, we fund uh, patient advocates, child life specialists, music therapy, art therapy up at the oncology department. We um, opened a school, the Andrew Rippon School, so kids that get behind in their studies yep. have an opportunity to um, – stay you know with their peers and stay up with their peers you know because a lot of times these kids are in there for and it doesn't it's not necessarily cancer but for whatever disease they have if they're in there for a long period of time they can stay caught up and they can graduate with their kids Mm. and and not be ostracized more than they're already Mm. being ostracized sadly through the uh, trials and tribulations they have i'm curious and thank you for sharing that yeah um when andrew's going through that what's your mindset like is it nothing else matters? Like, who cares about football at this point? Who cares about my career? My son is dying. Or is it football's an escape or your career's an escape? I'm curious, like, what was your mindset going through that? Well, I think f- first, um, you know, we, we didn't look at how was my, my glass is always half full. Mm. So I look at it as like, all right, we got a, we got a challenge, mm-hmm. you know, um, we're not going to throw in the towel, you know, we're going to, we're going to get the best specialists, the best doctors. And yeah. We're going to battle this. We're going to try to keep as much normalcy with our other two kids and, right. and Andrew and, and work as possible. I mean, I went from work pretty much every day to the hospital. If he was in the hospital, a lot of times it was great. He was at home, you know, recovering oh, yeah. from his, uh, uh, his blood counts were good and he was back at home and we could, Yep. Do what we did as a family. So we try to keep some sort of normalcy and and uh, and, and real, realize that yeah we got a challenge, but in life we're gonna we're gonna face a lot of these things. Football was it was there. It was great. It was have a lot of people that were very supportive. So I think you know having work 
you know, your work family and, mm. and, and uh, your family family, um, it definitely benefited. And ha- him being at a children's hospital, too, I think was essential. That yeah. was the reason yeah. for going back to work. It didn't have to go back. It was just because he could be around other kids. The kids loved their school. The, our, Amber and Angela, our two daughters, loved their school. So um, let's let's go at it from there. Yeah, yeah. So. Wow, thanks for sharing that. That's yeah. powerful. I know everyone goes through tough times, but losing a child, I can't imagine the pain that one must feel. Yeah. So It's uh, funny. It's not funny, but I, I get, you know, people are, are being very sincere when they come up to you and say, hey, I, I, I know what you're, you're dealing with. I lost my grandmother last week. And, I, <laughs> and at is, no, it, yeah. it's probably the... Uh, they're trying to be really, really nice, you know. But the, a grandmother versus a child are two you different things. Yeah. No, but yeah. they're, they're, but you, their, their thoughts and everything are, are, are with you, and and that's how I was. Uh, thank you, I appreciate. And I think that. also, I'm sorry you, for your loss. No, too, and you also know? when you yeah. know that you've been through that, you know, it puts things in perspective about yeah. the quality of life. Mark, nowadays, what makes you tick? What's what's driving you, uh, health wise, mindset wise? What what's kind of making Mark rip and tick these days? Well, I think there's a, a couple things. There's one is the um, uh, the ongoing efforts of the, the foundation. We yeah. merged because Spokane is a small community. We merged the Rippin Foundation with the Community Cancer Fund, which um, huh. is the adult side of it. We're the pediatric side, but you know, being a small community, you merge together, you're not hitting the same dollar donors ever. You're doing one, and, and you're taking care of two. Yep. So yep. it's a pretty uh, it was a pretty good thing. So I still work with the Community Cancer Fund. Um, that used to be the coaches. It used to be called Coaches versus Cancer. Okay. Mark Few is uh, and Marcy Few are still um, very much involved in, in our community and in, in in that aspect of it. And what a great great man he is and what he's done. And you you've probably tried picking his brain or you know I haven't met him yet, but man, oh I, I man, if you get a chance, respect. I mean, you know, I, I I look at now you're 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 more like Brian Harson than you are Mark Few, <laughs> but Mark Few, if you ever been to his practices, he's he's a motivated he's a no, he's a no BS guy, you know. All right, all and right. but he's just a wonderful like yourself, wonderful wonderful man. But so yeah, so I I'm uh, we're, we're we have a big. Um, hmm. fundraiser each year it's a, called a showcase and hmm. we bring in a lot of celebs and we do a little celebrity golf thing and we we also have uh, uh you know like Darius Rucker comes in and plays and we've had Adam Levine play on the lake we've had you know and we've had some really good and Ray we raised about three four million dollars in our little community for Jeez, wow. for Coeur d'Alene uh, slash Spokane wow. uh, community and so it's uh, that's a fun thing so we got that coming up in July we did we couldn't do it last year but so we're really eager about getting it done this year and I think we I don't think I'm I don't know if I'm supposed to but I think we got uh, the Doobie Brothers and and uh, you don't know if you should say Earth, well no I, we've got them on 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 the dock it's just whether we're going to go through with the just event announced on the Impact Show uh, the Impact Doobie Show Brothers. The Doobie Brothers sign up, be, sign up Doobie for Brothers will be playing Friday night and Earth Wind and Fire no on way. Saturday yeah and it's great because they come right on the uh, two two of the our, our big donors have a lakefront and they just turn into a big big party about four or five hundred of the Okay. Members come there. That's where they do the paddle raises, and I people are it. giving a hundred k. You know, so it's kind of a fun thing. So that gets me, you know, um, kind of to the community part of it. Then there's the other part of it that uh, is a. Um, a I think I spoke with you earlier about a, a company called Prevacus yeah. that uh, I'm involved in, and for all all moms out there, just to give a little ease of ease of mind, um, and and we can talk about it too. Is is I think what what the um, football, you know, whether it be junior football, high school football college football or pro football what they're doing now is is trying to make the the game a little bit um less um contact wise during practice and Mm -hmm. give the brain a chance to heal uh if uh your child or if an adult or if anyone that's had a tbi i'm i'm working with dr jake van landingham what is tbi just traumatic so, brain injury. Okay, just so no one knows yep, that. Yep. yep. Uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I think we're all. I know it's our language all, all the time. Right? Here, you know, we <laughs> it's like, our language all the time. Yeah, we like football TBI, players. You know, CTE. Right, you know, exactly. I, I can't even pronounce the CTE. <laughs> Chronic traumatic encephalopathy. <laughs> whatever. Um, anyway, so for any any parent or anyone out there that uh, the, the safety of the game is is being addressed daily. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Jake Van Landingham and his company have, have created a drug called Prevacus. It's a nasal steroid okay. that can be taken whether your cut your your son or daughter is can uh, has a has been knocked out or has a traumatic brain injury of some sort. They can take it through the nasal membrane. It goes into the to the area where the um, inflammation is of the brain and helps alleviate. Now it doesn't cure. 
you know, uh, uh, a uh, concussion, but it alleviates the swelling in the brain and the inflammation so in the brain. So one would take that right after a concussion? Right after, yeah. Injury. Whether okay. you can be in a car wreck, you can be, you know, yeah. a gymnast that uh, mm-hmm. you catches a cider, you know, and, and you're, you're just not quite there. Take it. And that alleviates some of the um, uh, the inflammation in the brain. Now, you know, I mean, the cumulative effect of all these things and what we're talking about in football is is that if we do this, it's going to take away from that cumulative effect because it'll the brain will you know is 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 very pliable and and you know it it just like jello you know bounces around. So if we can alleviate some of that, that's that's great. So Brett Favre, myself, and um, Kurt Warner and uh, Dr. Jake are kind of uh, pioneering along with Odyssey Group International that is the, the money behind it. And, and, and uh, so we're on their advisory board for that. So that's pretty exciting. Fantastic. Documentary coming out that, uh, or came out last year. Which one is um, that? It's called uh, Quiet Explosions. Yep. Um, you'd be, uh, I'd love you to watch it too. You, you'd really like it. Andrew Marr is a hero of mine, as mm-hmm. our, our military are, hero of mine, hero of yeah. ours, you know, is what they do. He was a Green Beret. He was the head of a bomb squad in, in Afghanistan, and he was right in the front lines throwing bombs and grenades in. It was happening all of them all the time. He came back from from Afghanistan and uh, had a family, he's five kids, and he's had twins on the way and, and basically found himself in a closet for like three days in a fetal position just because he couldn't um, you know, couldn't deal with it. So his life at that point in time was, was spiraling down to, unfortunately, we lose 22 of our service men and women daily to suicide was heading in that direction and he needed a drastic change. Along came Dr. Mark Gordon, who's part of this documentary is, as, um, as one of the doctors and Mark is a hormonal, um, uh, doctor that finds your, your deficiencies in your home hormones that you might have. And so you take a very elaborate blood test and, um, you basically get, instead of being what happened with Andrew when he came back, He'd go in, doctors say, you have depression, you have PTSD, you have this, yes, you have that. Yes. They throw you out there with opioids, they, yep. all these drugs. Jeez. He had a bag of drugs mm. that once he met Dr. Gordon, started getting on these supplements that uh, would help these deficiencies that he had. He threw the bag in the garbage, has never looked back, and and that's one modality of getting there. Another is Dr. Sam Bob Sammons, who's my uh, good friend from Harvard, and is the one that got me on transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a neuronal pathway in your brain that isn't quite triggering. You find it through this test that they do your fingers, and they find out which one it is, and then they put this thing on. It's like a woodpecker. It feels like it's pecking at you, you know, but it's actually just magnetic therapy that's going through your brain. How often to do you try do that? to You do that for... It's a 32-day program. It's not approved by insurance, but if you exhaust every other Absolutely. Ab- aspect, it is. The insurance will take care of it. And a lot of people are finding that they're getting down to nothing's working, but this could be one of the things that maybe will help. In 32 days, I do it. I, I did it initially because I have a seasonal affective disorder, you know, and up in uh, Northwest, we don't see the sun very often. <laughs> you need to come down, down here more often to hang out. <laughs> I am. Heidi's, Heidi's <laughs> inviting me down all the time. I'm going to come down more, you I know. Love it. And uh, so it's uh, during that October to, to uh, March, you know, time frame. It's it's very difficult. So I I went in there, did that, but all, all, all that also helped me through some other de- depressive uh, instances I had, some some behaviors that uh, I think were um, very trying on myself, my family, and um, and I think it just is, is another modality along with Dr. Daniel Amen, who does spec scans. Absolutely. He does a spec scan of Anthony Davis and. If you look at Anthony Davis' spec scan of his brain and spec scan of my brain, it's like two different brains. From being a running back and, and you, you know, from, from tackle football and him being a running back and every time he carries a football, it's like a car collision, mm-hmm. you know. His brain was pretty messed up. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dr. Dr. Amen is, is a brain health guy, um, you know, much like Europe. Uh, you know, peak performance guy. You want to get the most out of your guys through brain health and yep. through the working out and eating right and doing all those great things. He's the same way. Dr. Mm. Amen is a, a much about nutrition and diet as he is anything else along find about getting the uh, treatment that you possibly can need for either uh, psychology or psychiatric treatment that might help. So he's another one. And then um, I'm trying to think of the other one. But all interesting, this, this documentary starts with Andrew Marr it's called Quiet Explosions. Quiet Explosions. And, and someone can find that get on, on Amazon. Amazon. Yep. Okay. Get it on Amazon. It's an absolute uh, Jerry Shearer's award-winning, Emmy award-winning uh, producer. Uh, she produced this program, and uh, her actually her husband's in it. Uh, he went through And a, you're in it. I'm in it. Anthony Davis is in it. Uh, there's seven civilians. Um, 
folks, let's pick it up. Let's pick that up. Quite absolutely. Fire, I'm watch firefighter from 9/11's in it mm. because his PTSD he had from from losing. Yeah. You know that that where they have that guilt. Uh, you know that survivor's we, guilt. Survivor's guilt. Yeah. Yep. And uh, so he's doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Absolutely. Another another probably one that you recommend absolutely. to your athletes is is something that is uh, in, instrumental. And I think it's going to be hopefully soon here in all our VA hospitals yeah. for our veterans when they come back. So it's, uh, it's yeah, between some. hyperbaric chambers, stem cells. I just got the, injected with stem cells oh, just they, recently. We could talk a whole nother episode on that because yeah. I'm stuck. Like that's time. like, that's like three weeks ago and I'm still hurting, but <laughs> it's going to take a while, but I had them injected into my knees uh, yep. recently by Dr. Ambrosic from, uh, from who's uh, Rod, Gronkowski's guy yep. basically kind of got Gronkowski back into playing again because of stem cells, you know, stem and I think cells, that's yeah. a going to be just taken off here and you, you're probably Huge. a big component of that yeah. too. So several of my athletes have, have, have used stem cells as part of their recovery as yep. well. Tell me about your, your health routine now. What does your routine look like on a regular basis to, to allow you to think good and get your mind right as well as to allow your body to feel uh, somewhat normal after how many how many well, years did you end up playing? Thirteen years. Thirteen yep. years. Yep. So that's a that's a challenge though the the body and, and, and mind health because they both go together you know yes, and when your body's huge. not when your yeah. my knees are hurting and my back sore and I'm doing the thing that I love to get my brain healthy and feel that uh, was it epinephrine or epinephrine? epinephrine you know get that euphoria in or, my brain playing golf or you know endorphins or whatever yeah. yeah get the endorphins going in my brain then your body starts failing and then it's a challenge you know Absolutely. and they're fighting each other and, 100% and so um, I have that challenge with my body you know I'm I'm 35 your knees are hurting knees you are, can't my train knees the way are, you want exactly yeah. my knees are 35 I'm 35 40 pounds of my plane weight over so that's Putting a lot of pressure on that uh, that, that joint, and you, what do you times it by ten or something like yeah, that? Yeah, like yeah, three hundred fifty yeah. pounds on on each uh, knee. Yeah. That's that's a lot of stress. So I'm 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 working on my my. Uh, so folks, we're gonna have a fantasy camp. Mark Rippin and I are gonna have a fantasy camp. You I come would, down here and train. We're gonna we're gonna shed thirty pounds. We're gonna get your mind right. We're gonna get your soul right. We're gonna get your body right. I say I say we do a thirty day overhaul program. I'm in. <laughs> Let's go. I'm in. I did the keto thing about four years ago, and it was great. I lost like 35 pounds in about uh, two months. I wow. felt the best, looked the best, but then that I didn't. I didn't take it to that next level. So I, I I'm I, like like anything, and I, I know that uh, most of us need. Um, should you you should say need mm. it's always good to have a partner to do it with Absolutely. you know or someone that is there you know kind of pushing you along and that's why that's why you have been so good to so many great athletes here and and I know that Brett uh loves obviously with you know New Orleans Saints football if you know what Drew Brees means to you or you what you mm. mean to Drew Brees what he means to you you know and and the um uh the team yeah, the concept there, and but uh, it becomes if you get someone pushing you and and you know telling you great things or or just pushing you and say get your fat rear end uh, to do the right things. <laughs> we all need that. Yes, yeah, and we and, all need that. And you know, as a as a as a coach and a player, we also know the ones that you can just push and drive and, and they're and they're going to take it and they're going to go with it and there's others that need a little tap on the back okay. come on you can do it you know, tell them how great so they are. what do you do now to get your mind right like on a regular golf. basis golf, golf is my golf okay. you know yep, yep yep golf and uh my you know my work uh, being around my grandkids that's awesome my kids are grandkids are very active my little guy's a three-year-old he uh just got in a learn to skate hockey program there and after four weeks now the kid's skating yeah. Three years old, and he's out there skating. And then my granddaughter's 11, and she's going to be an athlete. My, my oldest, or my youngest daughter, Angela, played in the lingerie football league, and she's got some some injuries from that. She could throw the rock. She could spin it better than I could spin it. You're kidding. Oh, no, I'm not kidding. You got, you got, have, you, have you taken uh, no. any, seen any of their games? No. I'll, I'll show you a picture. Is that still going on? Well, it's kind of. She was kind well, of like the. COVID, she was kind of like the face of it, you know. Okay. But with COVID, yeah, I mean, all the arena league stuff has been. But they they were playing in front of. So she could spin it. Oh, they were playing in front of five, six thousand in what? Seattle, eight, ten thousand in Baltimore when she played for the Mist and the Seattle. Seattle supports Mist. its teams. They do. Yeah. I mean, I'm talking soccer. Oh football, yes. Football, baseball. Yep. I they're mean, gonna the Kraken are gonna be there too. The hockey team is just uh, get. They're gonna start next NHL year. team. NHL team. Yep. When is that happening? Next year. Did not know that. Yep. Yep. Man. Man, man. Yeah. Mark, I want to thank you for being on the show today, coming in and, and uh, dropping some pearls of wisdom. Folks, I hope you enjoyed 
stepping back in time and <laughs> and reflecting on some of my way glory back days. in time. Like, yeah. I, those are I, hey, listen. If you're like 35, 40 years old plus, uh, those were the glory days that I called them. And a little different game back then. But man, you talk about some legends that we're talking about. Uh, we certainly reflected on that. And more importantly than the game. Uh, Thank you for sharing from your heart and soul some of the things that you've been through with your son, Andrew, and how you're continuing his legacy now with the foundation uh, and then with quiet explosions and all the initiatives you're behind now. Thank you for what you're doing to make a difference, make an impact. Appreciate it. I, I, I tell you, this is important because of uh, COVID. Mental health is going to be a huge issue, as, as you well know, that uh, we're going to have a lot of people come out of this, some good and some not so good. So these modalities that uh, quite explosions are just out there for everyone to look at. But if you are having mental health issues and, and things that aren't quite right, please get some help. You know, I think that's uh, essential. I'm not in closing, but I did have a, a, a nephew that played in the NHL and he committed suicide because he was going through some mental health issues and he had the world at his feet, you know, and Rick Rippon and, uh, they, they're doing a lot of great things in Canada right now for the Ricky Rip Foundation and huh. Mind Check and all those things to, to make sure anyone out there, if you're going through some mental health issues, seek some help, you know, because there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be in that boat here. Amen soon. to that. That's yeah. the most important thing. Mark, if someone wants more information on your foundation, where would they find that or on anything? CommunityCancerFund.org. Okay. Yep, yep. Just in Spokane. And uh, Jared Kiefer is our executive director, does a wonderful job. And um, really, it's just, it's great to see a community, small community like that, uh, do do great things. And I, it's hard to hard to even talk about you know uh, all the businesses that support yeah. it because there's I'd, I'd forget too many. You no know, doubt. And you don't want to do that. No so, doubt. Yeah, folks, there you have it. Thank I you, hope you enjoyed that episode today with former. Washington Redskins quarterback <laughs> Mark Rippon uh, to win a Super Bowl and an MVP and to talk about Coach Gibbs and all the great things. Uh, check out uh, what he's doing. Follow him. He's an avid golfer now as well. But most importantly, he's making an impact in the world. So, Mark, once again, thanks, brother, for being here. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. Man, oh, man, was that a lot of fun. Mark Rippon. Folks, he's kind of surreal when you think about it. Part of what I love to do is his conversations. I mean, I was, I was a high school athlete watching these guys play football, and I go down to William & Mary, and I'm seeing this guy on TV and win Super Bowls, and the next thing I know, he's sitting in the TDE Global Headquarters, and uh, he's praising me for the work I do. Mark Rippon has done some amazing things in his life, and he's been through adversity. He's been through challenge. He shared, shared all of that today, and uh, I hope that today provided great value to you. And whether you're a sports sports fan or not, I do believe when you take the lessons that Mark shared, it's going to help you be the absolute best version of yourselves. Please, as always, be sure to share today's episode. I know there's someone out there in your circle, your family, your friends, your colleagues, your co-workers that will find great value and a lot of happiness in listening to today's episode. Until next time, remember, train hard, eat right, live inspired, and go create impact.